auto market recovery. I'm going to let those guys do their usual thing, introduce themselves and ask a quick question. And then I'm going to need your help because crypto market making, to some people, is a foreign language. Okay, um, so let's start from left to right. Um, David, would you be able to introduce yourself, uh, explain who you are, what you do, and also answer me one quick question. That question is, if you could sum up 2022 in one word, what word would you use? For example, my name is Joe, I work for Cointelegraph, and 2022 for me in one word was a uh, car crash. I mean, that's two words, but you, you get the idea. Okay, over to you, David. Okay, I can start with the uh, answer. Like I can say, like turbulence, like turbulence zone. Okay, let's let's use two words uh, as well. Turbulence. Yeah. So if you talk about me, like uh, I'm head of business development at Whitebit. What is Whitebit is a crypto to credit exchange platform, uh, founded in 2018, and uh, it's one of the, the biggest European exchange right now, and one of the biggest liquidity providers in Europe. Very good. Over to you, Steph. Uh, introduce yourself, then describe 2022 in, in one word. When the mic's working. When the mic's working. It there does. You go. Right. Um, no, I'm Steph. I'm at Kirok. I oversee all of our market making operations. Um, words in 2022 disappointment, I think. Um, I was doubting between shame and disappointment, but I think disappointment makes, um, is a stronger one um, and is maybe a bit more positive. Um, I think predominantly due to the fact that, um, yeah, all of the things that we tried to solve, um, you know, by embracing an amazing technology was proven to be the right solution. <laughs> so a centralization um, under the wrong circumstances and under the wrong guidance, um, you know, brings out maybe not the best of people. And uh, so disappointment is the reason why I chose that. A bit more about Kirok. So we're, we're a market maker. Um, we've been around since 2017, active on about 85 exchanges globally. Um, on the OTC side, spot derivatives, etc., and we provide a full suite of liquidity solutions to both, um, you know, crypto native entities as traditional finance entities when they want to enter the ecosystem. Fantastic, thank you, Steph. Patrick, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Patrick. Working for Crypto Finance, we're owned by Deutsche Börse, and um, 2022. One word is difficult. Just the one. Yeah, yeah it's difficult, but. Um, I would say it's not everything that is or that has been done in traditional finance is wrong. Regulation is not always wrong. That was 22 words, I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not to worry. Um, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, John Marillo, Chief Dealing Officer at B2 Brokers. We are a liquidity and technology provider. 2022. The year of challenge. Challenge. Okay, we have an optimist on the panel today. Fantastic. And Guilhem. Fine. Hi, everyone. I'm also optimist. Uh, I think I will use the word uh, resilience because, you know, we've seen the worst crypto environment since ever, I guess. Um, and nobody could expect what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, still, Bitcoin is trading at 25K. So it's, uh, Woo! It's, still, uh, it's still very bullish for what will happen in the next years. Uh, so my name is Guilhem Chaumont, CEO and co-founder of Flowdesk. We are a market making firm. We've been operating since uh, 2020, uh, and we have uh, offices in uh, Paris and Singapore. Okay, fantastic. Um, so as you can see, we have four market makers and one exchange on the panel. So you're in very good hands today to understand why market making is key to a recovery. Um, but first things first, I said I was going to ask you guys a couple of questions. Raise your hand if you're aware that we are in a bear market. Okay, if, if you're not aware, then yeah, the, as, as Guillaume just said, we're 25k Bitcoin. It was 60 something last year. Um, raise your hand again if you know what a market maker does in the crypto space. Okay, decent. That's a decent showing. Okay, um, for the rest of you, uh, you're in very good hands. And I've also asked uh, ChatGPT to give me a really good definition of a market maker because I'm a journalist who does lots of you know highly qualitative research. And um, I, I put a little bit of spin on it. So I'm going to ask you guys to check what you think of this definition, OK? Um, so where's my definition gone? Uh, bear with me one moment. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> it's disappeared. Here we go. So a crypto market maker is like a cool bartender at a very high-tech and unashamedly nerdy cocktail party. 
They keep the drinks flowing, i.e. provide liquidity, and ensure everyone's having a lit party, maintain order in the market, while secretly hoping no one gets too drunk, makes a fool of themselves, and, gets, and ruins everything, i.e. you're managing risk and getting the bouncers to kick out Sam Bankman Freed. Market makers are the ultimate party planners, but instead of balloons, cake, and a banging Spotify playlist, they use leverage, algorithms, and order books. What do you make of that definition? Is that something you can work with today? Steph, you're nodding your head, but there's a bit of a... Hmm, it, it's think? a great definition, um, but it, it's, it implies too much power to what a market yeah. maker does. And it's something that I don't like because it's actually the, you know, the, the reputation that we have. Um, we're actually the dance floor. We're actually the music. We're there to support um, you know, the party. Um, we're, we're there at all times. We're there at you know, 9 p.m. and we're there at 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, we're there for people to, without they know it, enjoy the party, right? Because they think it's normal to have music at a party. And we're there to be the, you know, the strong foundation, which is the floor, um, because it's actually needed for economies to be built upon. So I think I would rather go for these type of definitions, stop on my head in the same style of chat. Oh, I like that. But, um, you know, I think what I, what I really want to avoid is that people think we're the bartender that we control who drinks or not. Okay. I'll avoid that analogy in the future. Go ahead, Patrick. Um, I think there is also a very important part missing on that bartender analogy. Um, someone has to do the logistics. Someone has to make sure there is enough beer in the back and stuff for the drinks. And market infrastructure is super important for the market makers. Otherwise, you just have fancy pantsy um, flashing prices on a screen, but if you can't settle or if you're not comfortable with settling certain trades with certain counterparties, the, the marketplace is not as attractive as it should be. And everyone knows that you know, when a party runs out of alcohol, that's the end of the party, right? So when the market maker runs out of liquidity, similar thing. Um, David, you're the exchange in all this. Are we being too kind to market makers? Presumably they gave you a, a hard time in 2022. Or are you also happy with this analogy that they're the party makers, the party planners, the logistics guys, and also the bartenders? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, like uh, last year was very funny. <laughs> yeah, like I can, I can, I can be sure that it was very funny. And without market makers, we were like in uh, the whole industry uh, would be in the trouble. I say. And uh, so if we speak about like uh, music, like uh, Steph mentioned, like uh, I can support the idea that uh, market makers like uh, uh, add some music here, like to the party. So uh, yeah. Like, I can support this idea. Okay. Cool. Um, so let's move on to the first topic now, because I think we all have a pretty accurate uh, explanation of what a market maker does. Um, in traditional finance spaces, it's rare that you get market makers to come out and speak publicly, and it's even rarer still that they come and sit on stage at you know, quite large blockchain or TradFi conferences. Um, so, Guilhem, why am I sat next to you at a, as a market maker? Why are you transparent and public in the crypto space, whereas in the TradFi space, that's quite uh -huh. rare? I think it's an excellent question. Uh, and to complete the analogy of the bar, which was really good, we, we, we really need to keep in mind that it's, uh, it's not one bar. It's uh, dozens of bars. Some of them are centralized, decentralized. They open 24-7, 365. You have so many cocktails, 20,000 cocktails available. You don't know what's in them. And the prices are not in US dollars. They are in Euro, in Bitcoin, and whatever crypto. Um, I think, you know, it's market making in crypto is, is very different from traditional finance. Indeed, it's... Traditional finance is mostly going to be, you know, proprietary trading firm operating off their balance sheet, um, trying to generate PNL. You will talk about alpha, you will talk about sharp ratio, that kind of things. Um, in crypto, there is more a technological approach because the assets are much harder to price. Again, there are 20,000 cocktails, so there is no centralized market maker we can, which can just trade them very actively and make money out of it because these assets are unreadable. So I think in crypto, we have a much more technological approach. Um, some of us use the wording of market making as a service where the risks are actually split between the market makers, the projects, and some other actors. Um, and, and I think that's why it's very important to, to, to come out 
and to speak because I think there is a huge responsibility on our shoulders, not only market makers, to come out and give the tools for transparency to the token issuers so that indeed they can assess the work that is done. So it's, uh, it's, it's very important that uh, the, the market makers work in hands with the exchanges and with the token issuers and I think that's, that's why we're here today. Okay, John, what do you think? Do you agree? That's a very good point that Guillain makes here. Certainly. Uh, just like to make a small clarification. I'm not a market maker. I interact with all of you guys. Uh, essentially, we put together through our technology, all, all of you, and we distribute that tech to all of you. Um, the analogy was fantastic. I, I, I think, very well said, is there is a party out there. You just choose which party to attend because everyone has a party. And from our perspective, in the crypto space specifically, I come from traditional finance. But nevertheless, our approach on crypto makers is no different than it was in my old days, where you assess counterparties, where you pick and choose who you want to connect and integrate. Uh, I think that's the key into creating a, a reliable solution. Just to compare those two scenes then, coming from a TradFi background, why is it that in the crypto sphere, market makers are so much happier to be on stage, publicly known and you know, transparent? You know, we saw with GameStop last year that in the TradFi space, you know, with Melbourne Capital and all, all the shenanigans that went on there, that suddenly you realize, oh, market makers are actually, uh, they could be bad actors in this space. In the crypto sphere, I can reach out to market makers tomorrow and I can speak to them quite openly. Why is that? Well, I, I think they're in a better position to answer that question rather <laughs> than myself. Um, but from my perspective, the way I look at it is traditional finance guys, you will never get them here uh, in a million years. Crypto is a more open and transparent uh, industry in that sense. And I think it's more of a cultural difference between traditional finance and the crypto world. Interesting. Okay. That's so let's, let's ask the market makers then. I, I do have a theory. Um, market makers are super competitive, um, especially in the TrapFi environment. It's even below milliseconds um, who defines the race or who wins the trade and who makes the money in the end. And in, in TrapFi, they don't have to worry about logistics because the whole infrastructure is built, it's there, it's working. They just need to be fast on the exchange, on the screen. So they don't really like to talk to each other. But on the, on the crypto side, the infrastructure is not really there. It's quite fragmented. And as you said, you need to figure out with who you're going to trade, uh, which counterparty is giving you the most beneficial effect for your market-making business. And Reputationally, you need to check with who you want to sleep after the party. So, it's people are <laughs> people are more open uh, and talk to each other, and this helps to basically get the crypto market infrastructure closer together. The right people start to connect, and it's a bit like Facebook. The more connections you have, the more powerful and efficient it gets. Wow, okay, so there's a real value to networking in the crypto space for market makers. Steph, you're nodding your head? No, I am, yeah. Um, I just wonder if in 10 years they'll be like, remember that you were on a stage with Guilhem and Patrick? Those are the good old days when we were all friends. <laughs> um, you know, I hope that that remains the same, actually. Um, but I think that I, I share a similar vision as Guilhem and Patrick on that one, is that we are in, a, in an industry that is, is extremely exciting. Um, where transparency is, is part of its USPs at its core. Uh, so why, why all of a sudden become opaque on that front? But also, the, the, the concept of liquidity, what market makers bring to the industry, is it facilitates adoption, right? So working closely together with, with founders and, and innovators on that front is, is actually pretty essential when it comes to their go-to-market strategy or you know, with their, you know, when they're building out their vision, et cetera. And I think that, that collaboration, which is my, maybe not apparent maybe on, on traditional finance, where it's more of a, an alpha-chasing play by having a delta neutral strategy, et cetera, uh, is maybe the difference. Um, but yeah, I hope, I hope that's, that transparency and that, that 
collaboration exists um, and keeps existing. Um, and I think the infrastructure, because it's so fragmented and because it's not even a differentiator today, we all struggle with the same challenges. You're just like, you know, let's, let's build it together. <laughs> but when it's really good, you know, we'll reassess. But um, no, no, I don't think that's gonna be the case. And, and, I, and I welcome collaboration. This space is gonna grow 100x, right? So if we all grow with it, I think we'll all be very, very well off and very happy and it's gonna be a win-win situation. Okay, and just to check, David, you are friends with the market makers as well, right? Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, okay, so we've got a lay of the land. Um, I want to look back at 2022 before we look at 2023 and beyond and understand if we can get this crypto market recovery thanks to the helps of uh, the, the efforts of you guys. And of course, in 2022, as we've all illustrated with our first word, um, all hell broke loose in the crypto markets. FTX was a giant fraud. Luna went to zero. And exchange after exchange went insolvent faster than you, you can say the words Ponzi scheme. Um, however, it appeared, um, to me anyway, that market makers held up pretty well, especially if I compare the performance of market makers last year to the performance of market makers in the last big crash, you know, 2017, 2018. Um, firstly, like, would you agree with this statement? And like, to what extent would you evaluate the performance of market makers in, uh, in 2022? I'd like to go to John first, if that's okay. <laughs> um, 2022, an unforgettable year. I think is uh, in my career in the crypto world, it was the toughest year of all. And it was one event after another. It's like a domino effect of bad situations. I can only speak from, my, or from our relationships with guys like yourselves here, that some of them perform exceptionally well. A, they, they were stable at a critical point, which is uh, the key to assess counterparty risk. They manage to price fairly despite the conditions. And in our view, I think Yes, some bad apples got out of the industry, but those who stayed will become even stronger. And through time, this is a testament. Uh, I've been in the capital markets for 23 years. I've been through so many different things. And what I saw last year, it's an indication of great things ahead. I'm not trying to be just an optimistic. Uh, it's, it's just, facts, of course, those challenges that we saw last year, so many firms, and, and we interact a lot with our makers. It's part of the liquidity relationship, you know, to improve pricing, tightening liquidity needs of our clients, etc. Because if I can get that business in, it means we all win. So if you have a good relationship with your makers and they price that accordingly, I think it's a win-win for all. So overall, as a performance, I think it was pretty decent for some of us. Okay. Well, I mean, not myself as a maker, but for guys like themselves. Go ahead, Steph. What's more challenging for a market maker is a 10-year bear cycle than an actual aggressive event like last year, right? So there's a few things because of that. So I think, first of all, due to the lack of professional infrastructure, your county party risk is rather decentralized, right? If you're acting on 40 exchanges, you need to have capital on 40 exchanges. So if one blows up, in theory, you know, one fortieth of your capital is, is at risk, right? In this case, it was the second biggest liquidity source. So, you know, as a market maker, you had to, you know, keep significant, let's say, portion of the inventory on that venue to be able to price accordingly. Um, but that's already one where, on a counterparty risk perspective, you're pretty de-risked. Right? So if somebody had a massive issue, it showcased either some type of a directionality preference on that specific venue and you're running specific strategies. But if you're a true market neutral, delta neutral entity, you're going to be pretty diverse, diversified from a counterparty risk. Right? Secondly, the revenue model of a market maker is to make little, little tiny bits per trade. Right? So you do a lot of them, right? but you make little, little tiny bits. Right? Um, if a volumes, if volumes go down over time, that's when you're gonna be seeing, okay, where, where is the possibility for us to be a service provider and at the same time also 
um, be, be able to benefit from, from the volumes and the liquidity that's in the market or these trading that is happening in the market. And I think that's more of a risk than the shock events that we've had last year. Notwithstanding that it was the biggest lender, biggest liquidity providers, etc. So you had to be very careful on that front and you had to be very, you know, risk off uh, and, and, and act accordingly. So even though last year, you know, it was a huge crash, the volumes were so high that you're still making a bit of money along the way. Whereas if we had a 10-year bear, which obviously no one wants, then there would be less opportunity to make money because there would just be fewer trades going on. Okay. Patrick, is that a fair summation? Probably yes, but I, I would like to go yeah, back go to back. your first um, statement. I'm, I'm a bit more negative. Um, I mean, we have seen... Well, let, let, let's start at the beginning. The, the biggest issue in the, in the cryptocurrency trading ecosystem is capital, is balance sheet. And we have seen one of the biggest credit or liquidity um, providers, um, Genesis, going down. A lot of um, participants were basically, that they relied on the capital they were distributing on a in the end, on a, on a fairly cheap level, so they probably mispriced it. And then we had the other venue, FTX, that went down, which was one of the most capital efficient venue to trade on. So a lot of market makers had capital there because it was just the best venue to square your risk. Um, and I think the, the cryptocurrency market lost quite a bit of... Um, Mm, how, how shall I say that? I think we stepped back quite a bit because we do need capital in the space. We do need balance sheet. We need large players that have the right framework and setup to deploy capital to the market making firms or to firms that are better and quicker in showing prices. But underneath, there needs to be a reliable partner to settle or clear the trades. Okay, I guess it's that credibility loss, right, that's undermining the capital there. Um, to the point about the 10-year bear and the making money there, um, that was the second point. Do you want to address that or we can come back to you? Or? Well, in general, I don't like bear markets. <laughs> okay, I think you speak for everyone there. Um, uh, Guilhem, um, oh, there, there, is, there is so much to say on this topic, so I would give you a, a very subjective answer. Um, so, so first of all, for us, it's a bit different because we have a different business model where, <clears throat> sorry, we provide both the, the infrastructure and the trading team directly to the token issuers. So we don't make money out of uh, what we call the spread of the volumes. This is retained by, uh, by our clients. Uh, we just charge a monthly subscriptions. And, um, and of course, it's a, it's a less lucrative business model. We don't also, we do not rely on what we call call options, which can also be very interesting in, in bull markets. Um, so yeah, our approach is, is, is very different. And, um, and yes, we make um, much less money uh, on paper, um, anywhere between um, less 10 to 20 X less, but you build a much more robust business model. All the clients we started our business with, they are still working with us today. And, you know, we've just been piling up these subscriptions. We are doing 3x year on year, and, yeah, everything is fine. And, and just like our colleagues, you know, we, there are so much opportunities that are opened by these moments where some market makers are collapsing, like Alameda, it's giving a new door to, to new projects. And, um, and, and the last data point that I think is interesting for us market makers is if you look at the level of funding uh, in the crypto space right now, depends on how you calculate it, but it's more or less $1 billion per month into token projects. That's 10x what it was during the previous bear market. So there is still a huge inflow of money. And yes, it's an excellent moment to start a company. The funding is widely available for pre-seed, seed startup. For the later stages, it's a bit more difficult. And that's really the correlation that we have. If there are new projects, if there are new incumbents, we can serve, serve, serve them, we can give them the technology, and that's why our businesses are still quite viable. And you know that personally firsthand, don't you? You just went through a successful funding round. Uh, yeah, we announced it in last June, yeah, Series A round, uh, exactly, yeah. Well, there you go, there's the proof. Okay, um, David, before we move on to the next topic um, regarding you know, 2023 and looking onward, um, is there anything you'd like to say about the 2022 the loss of credibility, the fact that market makers somehow scathe through it um, from the exchange point of view. Yeah, here I can say that uh, if we speak about the credibility, yes, there we had like some, say, step backs. However, like, uh, I don't want to speak a lot about like situation about FTX, like, because uh, this is what we have right now, right? Uh, here, like, we had to take some uh, lesson from 
this situation and understand that we have to bring more uh, safety places, more uh, secure places in the market, like uh, to give the uh, to get the trust from the big players, from uh, market makers, so they can feel themselves uh, comfortable to work with uh, su like such venues like ours, right? So uh, I can say like like the last year like was very hard, but uh, in the other hand, it was very uh, good in terms of lesson perspective, like uh, what we have to do in the future to get the stable market, stable industry, to grow in the right way. Okay, very good. I mean, yeah, one of the key topics uh, of this year and for the future, I'm assuming, is going to be regulation. I mean, I know the SEC is looking at crypto uh, through the scope of a sniper rifle at the moment. Um, this question might seem quite ba basic, but in light of what we just discussed and the lack of regulatory clarity last year, I think it is important to address. Um, what regulatory considerations do you have to take into account as a market maker in the, in the crypto market? Uh, does anyone want to jump straight away at that question? Yeah, go ahead. Well, well, I guess you might need to refine the question a bit on what venues and how, how the venue is regulated. Um, we are on the fully regulated side, so we're not that fancy, and we we do markets on, let's call it um, the TradFi setup exchanges. So fully fully regulated with uh, rule books and everything, and trade cancellations or mistrades and all that kind of stuff. The the TradFi market um, already knows, um, but it's for the clients we talk to on the other on the other side, which are mainly banks. They just need that. They, they have massive issues if they need to go through their risk and compliance department and tell them, I want to onboard on this and that exchange. And they ask for risk policies, they ask for rule books, and the exchange goes, we don't have that. So it's going to be a, a difficult conversation. So for us, it's like we try to get the, the very high regulated financial market intermediaries into crypto on a handful of venues that are easy for them to onboard. Wow, so it's not even the regulators that are driving that level of sophistication regulation, it's actually the, the incumbents, you know, it's, it's the TradFi. If you want to onboard the TradFi, you have to have that level of, level of regulation. Yes, but given by the regulator. Oh, okay, okay, right, yeah. <laughs> um, Steph, would you like to come in there with, um, you know, addressing regulation in 2023? Yeah, it's, it's essential, um, and it's also essential for entities like us to, to be able to, to expand operations and, and to confidently also invest uh, in, in the specific operations that we're running. Uh, I think the lack of regulations gives unclarity, and it's very hard to operate under an unclear uh, environment. Um, so it's, it's extremely high on our list. We have a regulatory team and a compliance team, etc., focusing on nothing else and speaking with the regulators. Um, it, is a, it is a collaboration, right, because there's a need of a lot of education as well. Um, and I think as, as entities that are rather interconnected within the ecosystem, right, we are facing custodians, we're facing banks, we're facing exchanges, we're facing, you know, traditional institutions that, you know, want to get into the ecosystems. We, we do have those insights, um, but I'll be honest, we would love to have even more clarity, right, because we, we're ready to expand, we're ready to, to invest into the ecosystem, but a lot of it is being, you know, hampered or at least stopped because of that lack of clarity. So welcome it a lot. So I think it's uh, it's essential for uh, for, you know, this industry moving forward. Wow, it's interesting to hear though. It's, it's almost like antithetical to like the whole crypto thesis. Like we don't want to be regulated, but here we are. Market makers are, are crying out for it. I think you know it's it's it, it sparks innovation, right? And I think that's the, the what we've seen over the last twelve years. It's it's that that mentality of you know, questioning, you know, the establishment has been really great. It sparked innovation and, and it created a lovely ecosystem. And I think, you know, I, I'm, st I, I'm wildly in love with Bitcoin, for example, because of that. Um, at the same time, it, it's we, and this is sometimes, I wouldn't call it a frustration, but sometimes I, I wonder, you know, everybody says, okay, we don't want to talk with the banks. We don't want to know what they're doing, etc. But they've actually been 
300, 400 years, they have a lot of experience on how to do things, actually, <laughs> or how not to do things. So i rather have a collaborative approach on that front, and the same applies to the regulators, than, than us versus them. Um, in the end of the day, the market will decide what is most efficient, and the market will decide what's most interesting to have on their balance sheets. Um, so let the market decide, but do it together. Okay. And, and I still think there should be, I, ho I really hope so, a parallel ecosystem. So they, there should be the decentralized um, ecosystem where we can just plug in our wallet and trade on any DEXs, whatever token we want, without anybody telling us you cannot move that um, token or you cannot trade this token because of this and that. But there is also the other side needed where the banks are quite helpful in, uh, in showing us what needs to be the setup so they can open it up for their more conservative clients that don't want to plug in their wallets and uh, self-host them or self-store their coins. You have to have the two um, ecosystems. And the one ecosystem, the decentralized one, is going to be the innovative one. You will see new concepts coming out there, and some of it, I really hope so, swap over to the TrapFi side and make it more efficient. Optionality. You want to choose to self-custody? Great. You want to have it done by somebody else and pay him for that? Great. Right? So being able to have those parallels, is great that you mentioned that, because it's, that's, that's the exciting part. Right? That's why we're all here. That's why we're all so excited about this technology. So optionality, yeah. But Guillaume, is there not a risk that you know when regulators come in and they come in too hard, that might stifle the innovation? Yes, that's that's very likely, and that's already the case. And we see it with what's happening in the U.S. right now. I mean, I'm sure most of us here have a strong conviction that no staking is not a security. There is nothing wrong in having a stable coin if it's done the right way. Um, but we need to highlight that it's just a mechanical reaction to what happened um, in the last year, and. We, we are completely aligned with, with, with Kirok on that front. We are pro-regulation at Flowdesk. Um, and just like the analogy with the bar, it's a very complex equation because you need to be regulated globally. So we, we are registered in France. We are pending regulatory approval in Singapore. We follow the same path in the US. So again, crypto makes it 3x more complicated. Um, but regulation is not enough. Um, because our regulators obviously are lacking time, they, they always have this lag. So, so I think that, that there is three components. The, the first one is obviously, yes, we need to be regulated and compliant in every jurisdiction we operate. That's obvious, and we'll do it, we are doing it. But the second point is we also need self-regulation, because our regulator is not gonna tell us, you know, what we should do. We build cars that can drive at 300 kilometers per hour. And the regulator is like not aware of it. They don't understand it. When there is a crash, they're like, okay, no, now we stop all cars. No, 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 guys. We just drive at 130, and that's good, and that's perfect. Um, and the last point is the transparency. Because once we've said that, we also need to build the tools to show that we are transparent. And obviously, everything that is happening on chain is very helpful in that regard. But we also need to provide all the analytics for the counterparties we're working with, for the token issuers we're working with, so that they can assess our work. And at the end, it would be very Darwinian. The actors that are bad and that cannot be transparent will be mechanically excluded from a business perspective. And those who bring this value will obviously have more business and they will make science progress. Okay, I maybe should have used the car engineering metaphor earlier rather than the party planners. I think that makes a bit more sense. Um, John, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the optionality that Steph and Patrick were talking about earlier. Is that the sort of thing that would please you know, both parties? You'd have your, your DeFi DGENs, and you'd also have like the, those that don't want to you know, custody their own keys, look after their own, their own funds, be self-sovereign. Uh, we have a quite diverse client base, and we get all different types of requests. You cannot fulfill everyone's needs. But I will share what you guys have stated uh, before. It's people must be given a choice. And I am pro-regulation to some extent. Obviously, if we're over-regulated, then we end up in a situation where this whole uh, phenomena, right, all this development of crypto goes out the window. It defeats its own purpose. Um, but regulation brings transparency. Transparency ultimately brings credibility, and credibility is what everyone is seeking for. I think some of our biggest clients, for example, they only do business, A, trust, B, we're very transparent. We show 
basically our cards and let them choose what is best for them. Uh, a lot of people like to keep certain elements of uh, their operation to themselves, and I'm not disclosing here market making strategies, just for the record. I, I mean, uh, you know, what sort of business they're running. So I'm pro on the regulation side of things. It, it's, it's good for the industry, but to some extent, and I think we all play a role in it. Uh, if we can contribute to regulators in sharing our knowledge, I think we can have a self-regulated industry that is efficient enough. There you go. So we're not all getting too drunk at the bar and we're not driving our cars too fast. <laughs> That's not good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, David, before we move on to the next topic, I just want to check um, from the exchange sort of point of view, because exchanges seem to be under the most scrutiny right now, what with you know Kraken's situation with the SEC. Um, is, is the regulation of cryptocurrency market makers, is that something that could influence exchanges um, management for this year? Or is it you know, completely separate to your operations? Well, I can say that regulation is, some, uh, is something what we have to have here in, the, in our industry, because uh, as previously was said, like, uh, uh, regulations will bring us transparency, transparency will credibility, right? So, um, but the most important point here is how it will be implemented here in this market. And uh, we are ready to work on it. Like we are ready to help regulators to do it correctly. And uh, I can even say more. It was about like our exchange, right? So like, I, I don't know, uh, you, you know or, or not, but uh, we were founded in Ukraine, right? And uh, we are currently uh, help the regulator in Ukraine like to do it to make like correct laws regarding the cryptocurrency and regarding the whole industry itself. So if regulators are ready to, and they want to uh, bring more transparency in the market, they have to hear us, like the big players, exchanges, market makers, like, uh, like big players, as I said, and uh, understand that what they can do and how to do it in the correct way. But uh, in the conclusion, uh, again, like regulations are very important here because without it, we won't get, uh, we won't go like forward in the correct way. We won't have uh, correct grow of the market. Okay, cool. So moving on to that sort of last topic, which is a bit more futuristic. Um, as I alluded to earlier, I asked ChatGPT, a machine learning bot, to help me write this speech today. And it was, I actually did it myself in then because what it gave me was crap. But still, the point stands that AI is getting better and better. We are living in an age of you know, exponential technology. Market makers, as I understand it, most of the time, the algorithm's working at itself and you're only intervening when there's a problem or you know, when the order book messes up. Um, AI, of course, in, in this arena would thrive, one would assume. Um, how are you guys approaching this new uh, technology? Are you already harnessing it? And to what extent could it be, you know, you automate yourselves out of a job, in a way? Guillem? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's almost a philosophical question uh, because um, on the AI side, we, we are probably a few years away from uh, the singularity event where the AI would be able to uh, fulfill itself and keep growing maybe 10 years away, who knows? Um, so, to some extent, obviously, yes, every job can be replaced, even yours. Uh, maybe tomorrow yeah, we'll no, have, right. Tell <laughs> me we'll about have, it. We'll have uh, someone speaking and, 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 and stuff. But in the short term, there, there are multiple components from a market making perspective. First of all, the, the, the ground infrastructure, the connectivity, there is no real alpha to extract from an AI perspective. An AI could, could not code it better. You know, it's very simple, it's low level language, it's API integration, that kind of things. Then obviously on the pure market making quantitative side, um, there is a lot of machine learning, generally speaking, to be, to be added. And it's been 20 years uh, that, uh, that AI to some extent has been, um, has been influencing the way the algorithm work, back testing and so on and so forth. So there is already maybe, you know, I don't know, it's, it's hard to give a number, but the intuitive number would be maybe there is 25% AI in what we do. Um, humans controlling the algorithm are also AI to some extent, we could argue. So I think market making, however, particularly in crypto where it's heavily fragmented, will be probably the, the last area to be disrupted by AI. I, yeah, one of the last, I guess. Um, not too concerned. Uh, and, 
And again, there is this typical thing which, which we highlighted at the beginning, which, which is important, which is that market making in crypto is still a bit different from traditional market making. Some of them describe it almost as investment banking from time to time with the relationships, with the exchanges, getting the investors on board, working on some you know, less scientific topics like token economics and so on. So, so it's, it's very unlikely that you know, in the next five years or 10 years, uh, AI could, could, could disrupt it, but, uh, but who knows? We're safe for now. Um, does anyone want to jump in before I get automated out of this chair? Um. <laughs> Well, um, I, I, I might can add something to it because we're not playing in the Champions League in market making. We are like fourth regional league and uh, try to make our way through it. But I always fall a bit back into the infrastructure part because our mothership is um, they play in the Champions League for infrastructure. And I see AI as a potential um, support in um, if you run um, a, a custody business and if you run custody business for cryptocurrencies and you need to follow, I don't know, 18 different protocols and you need to um, evaluate risks um, within the blockchain, within smart contracts, um, the, there is no way you can do this manually. And there is no formal um, process if something changes that someone is announcing it to you and says, hey guys, we're gonna have this change in the smart contract, make sure in three weeks time you're up, up to speed. It just happens overnight. So maybe this could be something that is helping um, regulate the custodians to be on top of their game for um, monitoring blockchains. Okay. okay. Uh, anyone else wanna jump in there on the topic of AI and how that could influence the market making and why it's important for the crypto recovery, of course? No. Uh, Guillaume gave an amazing answer, so I 100% uh, agree. Nice one, okay, brilliant. Your jobs are safe for now. Um, we're coming up to the last sort of five, six minutes here. Um, I wanted to ask a much softer question here. We've talked about last year, we've summed it up in one word. You know, we had turbulence, we had a car crash, we had resilience, we had challenge. Um, when we're looking forward to 2023, what is it you're most looking forward to? And what is it that you're looking, um, what is the one sort of element of market making that you hope um, is part of 2023 because we're working towards this crypto market recovery. Um, John, looking thoughtful. As a liquidity provider and tech provider, I think for us, it's crucial to see guys like yourselves thrive because this is just going to bring a healthy environment for years ahead. Uh, it is crucial that you monetize on the flow you get from firms like us and that the industry becomes more mature as time progresses. I, as I said, I come from traditional finance. And I know some of us here as well. And we've experienced something similar to what we're going through many years ago. So I think the more credible you guys become, and through a bit of regulation, of course, and this industry has a very bright future ahead. It's just that it, we're in a bumpy road. Uh, well, yeah, moment. if you've been in capital market for 23 years, then you know, your first few years in the industry were during the financial crisis. So I, I did the maths earlier. I, uh, I experienced something incredible at the early stages of my career, which was uh, a bankruptcy of one of the major broker dealers in the world. So that's how I started. <laughs> Got a little bumpy back then. And I Baptism think, by fire. Yeah, yeah. certainly. Okay. Um, what, what are you looking forward to, David, this year from market makers? What do you hope they provide you as an exchange? Mm, well, I think that uh, this year will be amazing, to be honest, for market makers because uh, they will like get some, uh, let's say, uh, more regulated places, like because uh, after the last year, as I said, like regulations will be one of the important points here, right? And uh, once we get more regulations, once we get, once we become more transparent, I mean, the whole industry, market makers will feel them more, more, more comfortable here. So this year will be very good. I, I hope so, even. <laughs> so let's see what what will what will be. I mean, uh, but I hope it will be an amazing one. Okay. Big vote of optimism there. Glad, glad to hear it. Um, Steph. I think what we're seeing right now in DeFi is extremely exciting. Um, I think 
so, you know, we, we can't compare this, this time to 2018, where there was uh, close to no innovation. Um, and the inter interactions that we're seeing on chain today are just incredible. Um, and the applications that are being built right now, and you're looking at, you know, credits, but you're looking at secondary markets, but you're looking at, you know, marketplaces of a new asset class called NFTs all of a sudden, who's doing, you know, incredible amount of volume. Um, I think the innovation on that front is, is you know, the reason why, why we're all here. Um, and the role that a market maker can play on that front, I think, is, is, is going to be important, not only as a power user, but also as a service provider. Um, and I think that, and you're seeing the trend already right now, especially with tracked wallets, et cetera. We're going to go and enter the era of on-chain reputation, right? And the way you interact on-chain is going to define how you can interact and which, which counterparties you can interact, et cetera. And um, market makers' wallets down the line will be, will be tracked, will be monitored, and will be held accountable uh, through this DeFi innovation. Um, so for us to, and we've been doing that you know, over the years, experimenting on that front, for us to be you know, increasing our, our, our efforts you know, as a market maker in this industry and, and to be an active participant is, is what we're most excited for this year. And uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be exciting. Yeah, it really harks back to that theme of transparency, which I think comes through throughout this talk we've had today. Um, Patrick? Um, even if it sounds boring, but I think um, well, I'm actually looking forward to regulatory clarity. Um, the regulatory clarity helps as well to then play regulatory arbitrage, which has always been there and will always be there. I mean, in TrapFi, we see it day in, day out but it's at least then clear what are the rules and what are the boundaries. It will help the, the market to be more liquid and, and more people being uh, comfortable going in. And the second thing, I'm really looking forward to it, but maybe 2023 is too early. Um, the bridging between real world assets into representation of um, tokens on a blockchain and then having the clarity and the enforceability to actually make use of this. I like that. It's an interesting, interesting thought. And finally, Guillaume. Um I, I will take it from a higher perspective than market making. I guess it's uh, it's very hard to not be not to be bullish about crypto right now. When we look at the activity, the price itself, of course, which is one of the components, what is happening on the layer twos, it's crazy. Um, and I think. Very likely in the next 12 to 24 months, we will see emerge a significant order book based decentralized exchange. That's one of my conviction. Uniswap it could be, uh, because this is, this is the, the only way to create efficient markets. At least it's the best we've found, order books. Um, from a market making standpoint, it's, we are also quite excited because we see this new wave of tokenization which is coming. Uh, with all the securities being tokenized, and it's it's opening an insane amount of doors. You know, in 10 years, we we've seen the emergence of 20,000 tokens, more or less. If we think about the tokenization of all the assets, securities, but even other assets like real estate, I mean, yes, there will be a huge market, which will be heavily fragmented. Everything will be traded from our houses, our stocks, our early early stage state startup. So, um, so no, we are quite excited, but we need to understand the, the responsibility that we all have. Uh, because uh, I, I was talking to an investor a few weeks ago and it struck me, I told him, you know, the typical pitch, uh, you know, it's normal, crypto is very early and it's normal. And he told me, no, it's been, it's been 12 years. And um, we don't have so many bullets to do what's right. And, uh, and I think that's why it's very important that we, we understand this responsibility. And that, that's why we really need to, to build what needs to be built from all perspective. And we need to do it now. We have a few years left. Yeah, it echoes what you were saying earlier about the self-regulation. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, guys, for your time. Thank you very much for the European Blockchain Convention for hosting us. I hope we've made it clear to you that crypto market making is very important for the, uh, for the recovery that we're all hoping for. Can I have a round of applause, please, for David, Steph, Patrick, John, and Guillaume?